Hey, welcome to London 360, the news feature show which keeps you in the know about everything that's happening in the capital. You can catch us here every week or you can watch the show online anytime at communitychannel.org forward slash London 360. And get involved and keep up with the action behind the scenes by following us on social media. Don't go anywhere because coming up we've got some exciting and wonderful stories starting from a football match in support of refugees, the star-studded lineup celebrating the good deeds of school children. Diversity within the creative industry has always been discussed, but in 2016, the inequalities of the sexes is still a big issue. Digital and social media have made it easier for people to express their outrage on these problems. Female celebrities like Kesha, Jennifer Lawrence and Annie Lennox are examples of women speaking out about what they've encountered. Here in London, a group of inspiring female celebrities are looking to rock the boat within the industry. Yasmin Tamwajaya Paharas and I went to find out how. Different campaigns and groups are speaking up and empowering each other to improve the female representation in the creative industries. We attended two events focusing on this. One was a discussion with Sadiq Khan and members of the Creative Industries Federation at one of London's biggest galleries. The other was Girls I Rate, an all-female dinner on a yacht on the Thames. It's new, it's fresh, it's me bringing women together. Um, I think it's really important that you know women start really working together, building a network for themselves. Encourage, excite, infuse, inspire the young people to enter those industries. The world's leading artist, Adele, went, went to a school in Tutin before she went to the Brick Academy in Chestnut Grove. And so well, we've, got to, we've got to push and promote that much more. You know, that's, relevant, that's relevant to obviously gender inequality in, in London. Diversity within the creative industry doesn't just stop with race. It also includes gender. Inequalities within the industry are repeatedly being highlighted. Coinciding with International Women's Day, a movement is being created here in the heart of London. It's great that we come together as a collective and celebrate and recognise um, those women and also help each other and support each other to create a network um, that could potentially inspire others. It's fantastic to be here, not only you know celebrating people and empowering people individually, but also collectively. So I want to salute all the inspirational women here. I've been raised by women, so women are really, really strong in my life. So for this, it's really important to me. People believe it's gotten better and it really hasn't a lot. That's more of a challenge, so we're still trying to fight to make everybody aware that it, there's no, it's not equal between men and women. Women do rise quite high, but if you look around at the big organisations, there are very few female leaders on the very, very top. People look down on you thinking that you won't know a certain topic, um, you know, whether it's football or politics, where they think, oh, well, what would you know? You know, I remember being actually at a football match saying something which happened, and he said, well, what would you know? You're a girl. We were signed to a, um, a label. It was mainly men running the show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they never really got to know us personally, know our uh, personalities and what we wanted to do. I have had so many pushbacks, but in a way that kind of makes you stronger. And I'd give any advice to any girls kind of wanting to do sort of anything in life. It's to an achieve an exam, to achieve, you know, in an interview, anything. Just really go for it. I'm a dad. Both my children are daughters. I worry, will they be able to have their potential fulfilled? I don't want them to suffer harassment in the workplace. When it comes to the jobs they want to do and aspire to do, they should be able to do anything they want to do. Being a black woman, you weren't taken seriously in terms of business. People were, you know, they kind of used to turn up their nose at you if you called on the phone and they would almost have a snigger or a laugh thinking, well, what makes her think she can go from pop to business? Gender equality needs to be as important for men as it is for women. And so actually, it shouldn't be just women who are having to speak out about this. Uh, we should all be speaking out about it. We should all be uh, restless and discontent until we have proper equality and diversity in all its forms. When girls are trying to create things, they're trying to empower each other, we, we basically open the door for everyone, don't we? As soon as that one person sees success in a certain lane, then it opens the door for everyone. I think we need to look at the genuine value that people are creating in the work that they do. And I think that's not necessarily a gender argument, that's for everybody, but it comes because the value system that we have now absolutely benefits the men. How are we actually going to try and change certain things? How are we going to see more um, females in the studios as producers? How are we going to see more female um, A&Rs? How are we going to see more, you know, how are we going to implement these different things? So I feel that that's going to be the next conversation for us to all start having. 
With the refugee crisis at the forefront of international news, Dalit Hamlet Football Club and their fans decided to do their bit for Syrians, with a little help from As Syrians. Daryl Hammond went to find out more about Syrians and how their football team banded together to aid those in need. As the outlook grows bleaker for refugees in France, two London football clubs have taken it upon themselves to help end their plight. Here at Champion Hill, Dulwich Hamlet took on FCS Syria in a charity match, with the proceeds going to the Southwark Refugee Project and British Red Cross Syria Appeal. Here Lots of residents and constituents of mine were phoning me and emailing me and asking what they could do to help Syrian refugees. People were offering bedrooms in their houses. You know, there was a real outpour of generosity. Hamlet's opponents, FC Assyria, are a club based in Ealing, formed of diaspora Syrians. They hail from a part of the world which now comprises of Syria, Iraq and Turkey. So for some, this is a cause very close to their hearts. FC Syria are originally, uh, all our players are descended from Iraq, um, which is one of the troubled regions as, uh, as well as Syria. So we were close to this cause. You know, we still got family over in Iraq and um, we all thought it would be the least that we could do and help raise some money as well. It's um, shocking to see. Um, our heart goes out to everyone that's still there and everyone that's, you know, trying to fight against what's going on over there. So um, stuff like this brings us together and um, hopefully raise money for, for charities like that. Dulwich Hamlet have tackled issues such as racism and homophobia in the past and manager Gavin Rose believes football has a big part to play in instigating social change. Ever since I've been here I've always known that it's had a community sort of a feel to it. Um, it's a supportive club. Uh, we're in it together as a family um, and very much um, welcoming of other people. Um, no matter what race, creed or whatever it may be. So I think everyone needs to use football sometimes as a, a bigger tool to, sh to show everyone what's really happening in society. One group of Dulwich Hamlet fans have taken things a step further by setting up their own initiative known as Dulwich to Dunkirk. Fans gathered food and other supplies to take across the channel and used the match as an opportunity to gather much needed resources. Me and some of the other fans had been talking about how we wanted to help out with the refugee crisis. We've been to the camp in Calais and the camp in Dunkirk as well. The conditions are absolutely appalling, utterly filthy. There's rats, there's rubbish, there's human feces and there's children living around that. I think it's about time that our Prime Minister made sure that we take our fair share of refugees. Our Prime Minister absolutely should be ashamed of himself and he should be doing more. Of course he should be doing more. In response, the UK Home Office made this statement. The UK believes the best way to help refugees is by providing aid in regions of conflict and the vast majority of refugees are better off staying within the region. We have committed to resettling 20,000 Syrian refugees under our Syrian Vulnerable Persons Scheme and have already provided refuge to more than 1,000 people in need of protection. Football is so global. Uh, anywhere you go, you can go uh, to Antarctica and they'll still see people there and they, you know, you'll see football. You'll go all over the countries in, uh, in Arab countries, they all want to play football. Uh, same in Europe. I think it just unites people in order to get a message across. So this game helped us get together and the message was Refugees are welcome and we want to support them as much as we can. Here at London 360, we love to give people a platform to have their say about their great city. So we invite you to send your stories, points of view or even passionate rants. Anthony Kazim from Harringate shares his thoughts on London's overcrowded trains. Take it away, Anthony. Hi, my name is Anthony Kazim. I live in the borough of Herringay, mum and brother. There's over seven million people in London, and rush hour can be a problem for everyone getting to work. People can be claustrophobic and don't like being in tight spaces. Every day when I get on the tube, it's just so crowded. Every single day, and it's just sometimes the doors open, and there's really nowhere to move. You can't walk on the train because there's just people everywhere. If you stay crowded with people, you just Smell others, you know, that's that's a bad point, you know. I don't usually travel by train, but by bus, and the bus services are good. 
Not to mention, kids can get lost in big crowds. My solution is to get double-decker trains that they have in Paris. I think double-decker trains would actually be a great idea. Even though maybe it could be a little costly, I think since so many people use the tube every single day, it'd be so much more comfortable. And I think, yeah, that sounds like a great idea to me. Welcome back to part two of London 360, bringing you real and alternative stories from London's hidden communities. No ifs, no buts, no third runway. Those were the words of David Cameron in 2009 on the Heathrow expansion. However, when plans were approved in 2015, 13 protesters took to the runway to make a stand, got arrested and landed in court. Renelle Felix went to Wilson Magistrates to talk to some of the demonstrators before their sentencing. 13 activists who chained themselves to Heathrow's northern runway are expected to be the first climate change protesters to be jailed in the UK. This comes after they were sentenced in January of aggregated trespass and of entering a restricted area. We would be the first climate change activists ever to go to prison. Our barristers this morning were talking about the last environmental protesters sent to jail was in 1932 for an invasion of the common land. So this really is unprecedented. The government's trying to build a third runway at Heathrow. A third runway would produce as much carbon emissions as the whole of Kenya. The Heathrow um, airport has claimed that it cost an awful lot of money to cancel the flights. But people waiting in the airport, they got on flights later in the day, and actually the cost of a few flights does not compare to the cost of climate change. While waiting for the judge's verdict, the Heathrow 13 stressed the importance of freedom to protest and direct action. For her to choose to send us to prison quite easily can be seen as a, a political decision to try to in, instill fear. Last year, 300,000 people died due to climate change. We know it's an affluent minority taking short haul destinations because it's convenient for them to do so at their leisure. But not everyone supports the Heathrow 13's actions. The reason why many local residents and small businesses support the Back Heathrow campaign is because they want to see the benefits of an expanded employer. We've got 76,000 jobs direct, 114,000 indirect. You know, it is the economic engine of West London and the Thames Valley. When it comes to playing stupid, I have some difficulties in their messaging and their consistency. In terms of the environmental impacts of Heathrow, it's an airport, so of course there are environmental impacts. But the Independent Committee for Climate Change has said that Heathrow can expand and we can still, as a country, meet our carbon limits. To the activists, I understand their concerns. I have a foot in both camps as a pilot as well as an environmental researcher. I don't believe those levels would be dangerous if you had a third runway at Heathrow, but they would increase beyond the current limits that are set at EU and local levels. Long-term health studies need to continue Need to occur, we need to continue the monitoring, but it's time to make a decision. After waiting patiently for hours due to delays in their sentencing and with the possibility of imprisonment hanging over them, it was a relief for the Heathrow 13 to see the police vans leaving instead of taking them to prison. I kind of did it out of despair, I didn't know what else to do, and here's a way to actually do something that might have some effect. And just seeing the amount of support and that's just grown out of it makes it worthwhile and gives me hope that actually we can do something. It's an absolute victory for democracy. Uh, it's a victory for the campaign against Heathrow and Snowy Runways. And um, personally, I'm just so relieved to have walked out of that court today. The architectural contrast of old and new in London is one to admire. But with rising rents and house prices on the increase, as well as more international investors, the streets of London are evolving. The Olympic Borough of Newham is one area that has experienced change at a racing speed. Lape Banjo spoke to some very frustrated members of the community. My daughter was working part-time and they offered her a place in Birmingham. How can she go to work in Dagenham and live in Birmingham? We knew it was going to come to our, our face when we would have to move out anyway. So 
we just decided to take the offer. They said to her, she don't earn enough money to live in Newham. She don't earn enough money to live in Newham. Born and bred in the Newham. And St Catherine's Docks was built on the Thames in the early 1900s. Over a thousand houses were demolished. Even 11,000 people displaced without compensation. In 21st century London, this process has a brand new name, Regeneration. And nowhere is this more evident than the London Borough of Newham, which is now the most regenerated area in Europe. At a time when millions of Londoners need affordable housing, many council houses are being knocked down and replaced with luxury apartments. So I've seen Stratford go from being somewhat flat to now being, there's more sky rise um, apartments, there's much more housing available, and there's, you know, Westfield being one of them. But we've also had regeneration of the train station and the local area. So there's much more investment in the area. You can see it, it's tangible, it's there and it's much different from how it was 20 years ago. However, in the wake of the 2012 Olympics, the local council cleared the carpenter's estate in Stratford to continue regenerating the area. Young mothers with small babies who were in um, supported accommodation in Stratford because of vulnerabilities in the past, and Newham was prepared to just send them out of London. Rather than us just sitting there and taking it, uh, we all decided to get up and fight. Years and years and years ago, you were you was actually housed next to your parents or next to your siblings, so you actually had a unit. This is going. 29 mothers in the hostel who got together and said, no, we won't be moved out of London, started something very powerful because they were saying no to social cleansing. You know, Robin Wales and his cronies in the Labour Council, they are interested in making something great out of Stratford. What they mean by great is for the rich. You know, those who can afford can buy in and those who are poor get chucked out. Accusations of social cleansing are unfounded. Over 70% of council tenants on the Carpenters estate were rehoused within the Stratford area. 94% of residents were rehoused within the borough and 6% requested to leave Newham. The council has made a commitment to every resident, whether they're council tenants or homeowners, that they can return to the area as developments are completed. The vast majority of the residents who have been relocated have remained in the immediate vicinity of their home or within Newham. We've lived uh, happily in Canning Town for over 12, 13 years. We were told before, just before the Olympics that uh, our area is uh, part of the areas that are affected by the regeneration. But then, at some point, they, they told us that there was uh, a, some money they want to use to buy out the homeowners and asked if we were interested in, uh, in taking the advantage. We moved to Essex and uh, I think it's quieter there. I like, I like the birds singing, so it's a, it's a, it's a choice really, uh, it's a personal choice. We do need to build more housing, but it's also a challenge because central government and also regional government don't often allow us to build those houses. If we have to sell um, a council house on um, right to buy, the money doesn't come back to the local authority to build more houses. It goes to central government, goes to the treasury. It's about money, greed and money, and humanity is suffering for it. Children may look to artists for inspiration, but at this special event, it's celebrities, powerful speakers, and even royalty that are inspired by young superheroes across the UK. Yasmin Tamwajaya Baharez joined the celebrations for the young leaders of tomorrow. Being kind has a ripple effect. We want to start a kindness revolution. <laughs> Children have all gathered here at Wembley Arena alongside notable celebrities to celebrate positive impact and social change. But unlike any other event, this event celebrates the children as role models. It's We are at Day 2016. <laughs> it's our third Wee Day UK. Uh, it came here three years ago and it's, a, it's, it's started by a Canadian charity called Free the Children about inspiring young people to help young people. You can't buy a ticket, you have to earn it by raising money, doing some global action or local action. And so all the kids here have been working throughout the year, raising money for good causes, and this is kind of their uh, thank you. We've got Rita Ora and Bluey, and we've got uh, Professor Brian Cox here. We've got Marley Matlin. I'm really looking forward to uh, 
to talking to her, and uh, I know she's such an inspiration. You know, we're going to have roughly 10 plus thousand people here today, and that's yeah. a huge network of people. Just to go to India, to interact with new people, to work in the local villages, it gave me the motivation to believe that I can make a change to this world. I took home more than just memories from my trip. I found my voice, I found my confidence, and I found my passion. Even working with your friends, this changing the world process takes some effort. Beatrice and I speak from experience. A few years ago, we and a group of friends had the most amazing time raising money for charities by running the London Marathon. We didn't want to lose that rewarding feeling. We always want to use our music, you know, to support, you know, good, good, um, good events, charity, and especially kids. And today it's all about kids, so that's why I use a lot of stuff to them. We marched from Tower Bridge all the way over to City Hall for issues that we cared about. We were remaining silent for them. We did gender inequality. It's just such an amazing event, getting these young people out here to encourage them to do good, and they've all done something amazing to be here. The funny thing about these kids looking to artists and people in the media for inspiration, it actually goes the other way because, you know, we show up to these things and I'm a pretty normal person, but then when you see what these kids are doing and the way they look at the things that you do, you, you, it makes you want to step up to the plate. So what We Day tries to do is to break down those barriers and to bring people together with the belief that together we can change the world. Craig Kilberger was 13 when he started Free the Children. I think if he did that by himself and a few friends, what would it be like if everybody did that? The charity work can be quite difficult. You're dealing with difficult subject matters, quite depressing stories sometimes, but it's so rewarding and I think that um, if you can take your energy and make it as fun as possible, get a group of people together to, to have an amazing time while trying to solve problems, um, you don't get as burnt out. Have the courage to accept the challenge. Dream big no matter what life throws your way and you will achieve success. That's your lot for this week. We hope you enjoyed the show. Want to find out more about any of the stories featured? Then head over to communitychannel.org forward slash London360. Be sure to join in on the conversation and hit us up on social media. And remember, keep it 360.